I'll say 90. Is there a specific name for someone who collects flags? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> it's a vexiologist. A what? Vexiologist. Huh. As in they vex their neighbors? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, it beats flagulent. <laughs> what? That and sounds a little inappropriate, Peggy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear what she said. Yeah, it's just as well. I should have. Okay. No, it was good. <laughs> Hello, dog. Woof. I, I always thought it was strange that a flutist was called a loudest. Uh, that why in the world would you change? I mean, where did that come from? The, and um, we're reading a cast in the book group for today. And uh, I was really surprised in there where she told a story about um, how in ancient Hebrew times, people would bring two goats to the priest and the priest would lay hands on the goats and decide which one was going to be sacrificed to the Lord and which one was going to bear all of the um, mm -hmm. troubles of the, of the people and be banished into the wilderness, chased away. And that's the scapegoat. And I, I had no idea that it had such an ancient origin. Um, wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, it was fascinating. Yeah. I like etymology anyway, but, you know, um, that particular one. Never heard that one. Hmm. And I don't remember what's the uh, Jewish. Uh, holiday or, or not holiday, but um, uh, commemoration of re of atonement is that Yom Kippur or is that? That's right. Okay, so th that was was what it was for was, was for Yom Kippur. I had friends in Eugene that would go down to the river and and take all the change out of their pockets and throw it in the river for rep you know their troubles put, put their troubles on the the coins and throw them in the river for Yom Kippur. <laughs> oh. Interesting that what things we come up with for various things. We're going to hear a little bit about Yom Kippur in the lesson today as a matter of fact a little bit. Mm. And uh, it's 10 o'clock, so I think we should probably get started. I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen. I think they're going to mute me, so it probably doesn't matter, but right. it can go either way. <laughs> Okay, let's see if I can get all of my windows here arranged so that I can read what's what I have on my screen. Sometimes the zoom windows get in the way of what I'm reading. Okay, here we go. Road trip, the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. We're already up to session five. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, this is Paul's arrest and transport to Rome. Uh, there's there's a lot of excitement in this uh, in this lesson, a lot of action. Uh, looking ahead briefly to next week, uh, Paul for a new day. We're going to completely switch gears. Uh, let me go through the books that I'm using here. Um, the commentary on the Book of Acts from uh, Fortress Press. In Search of Paul by Crossan and Reed. And then uh, next week is going to be more of a book report uh, than a, a Bible study. Uh, Paul for a New Day. Uh, the story is, I, I, uh, I've, 
I taught this class in the past. It was about 11 years ago. Uh, but at that time, it was only five sessions. And this time I had six sessions to fill. And I thought, well, why not use the sixth session the black one? to talk about um, the uh, uh, applying Paul's thinking to today's world. So this book was recommended to me, Paul for a New Day. And next week, I'll give a book report on this, uh, on this book. All right, another geography lesson. <clears throat> uh, after Paul's arrest in Jerusalem, he, he was taken to Caesarea on the coast. We'll, uh, I'll go over why in a few minutes here. And then uh, boards a ship, they put Paul on a ship. Paul appealed to the emperor, so they put him on a ship that would eventually reach uh, Italy after stopping at Sidon and several other places along the way. Uh, after they sailed uh, from Fair Havens in Crete, uh, they ran into a storm and the, uh, the, uh, the ship was beached on the island of Malta. And they had to stay there until the stormy season passed. Then they sailed up to Syracuse and Sicily and uh, finally uh, Paul uh, eventually made it to Rome. So this, this is the geography of uh, the story today. First, Paul's arrest, starting in uh, Acts 21. Now, Paul arrived in Jerusalem after his last missionary journey and went to see the apostles. Uh, they uh, were encouraged to hear how many Gentiles he had converted to Christianity, but um, they had some complaints about his dealings with Jews. Apparently, some of Paul's Jewish enemies had told the Jerusalem apostles that Paul was trying to tell Jews that they didn't need to follow the law. Well, see, that sort of overstepped the boundary that was set when uh, a few chapters ago, we read that the uh, Paul and the Jerusalem apostles came to an agreement that uh, Paul would proclaim to the Gentiles and the Jerusalem apostles would proclaim to the Jews. So uh, to, 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 to hear that Paul was telling Jews that they didn't have to follow the law, uh, they were upset about that. Uh, now, I don't think that was true. <laughs> Paul was a good Jew, but uh, you know, Paul's enemies are trying to get at him any way they can. So, <clears throat> excuse me, he was persuaded to prove that he was still a devout Jew by participating in a Jewish purification ritual. So that took place in the temple. Now, the problem was that the enemies of Paul saw him in the temple and they uh, incited the crowd and started a riot against Paul. At first, Paul was taken into protective custody. The authorities didn't want Paul to be uh, slaughtered by this mob. He asked for and received permission to address the crowd. I think the authorities thought that Paul was going to explain himself and try to, to uh, calm down the crowd, which initially that is what happened. Uh, Paul defended himself by explaining what had happened on the road to Damascus and about his Jewish upbringing, uh, how he was even present at the stoning of Stephen, uh, the, in you know, all of that, he defended himself to the his Jewish uh, background to the crowd. <clears throat> all was well until Paul said God sent him to minister to the Gentiles. Now, of course, uh, there were several Gentile nations who were bitter enemies of the Jews. So the thought that the Jewish God would send someone to minister to the Gentiles was too much for the crowd to take. And the riots started up all over again. Uh, I want to read part of this. This is uh, Acts 22, starting with uh, verse 17. And Paul is now, in, this is in the middle. I'm going to start in the middle of his, or rather toward the end of his uh, speech of defense for himself. 
after I had returned to Jerusalem and while I was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw Jesus saying to me, hurry, get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in every synagogue, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And while the blood of your witness Stephen was shed, I myself was standing by approving and keeping the coats of those who killed him. Then he said to me, go for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Verse 22, up until this point, they listened to him, but then they shouted, away with such a fellow from the earth, for she, he should not be allowed to live. And while they were shouting, throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the tribune directed that he was to be brought into the barracks and ordered him to be examined by flogging to found, find out the reason for this outcry against him. The Roman officials were, were puzzled by this. The Roman officials didn't know much about Judaism. So they initially took him in to be flogged, but his Roman citizenship came, uh, came up again and saved him from, from a flogging. Uh, the uh, Jewish authorities were afraid to flog a Roman citizen for uh, fear of what the Romans might do in retaliation. So he was released on his own recognizance pending a, a hearing before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court. Now we get to Acts 23. In front of the Sanhedrin, Paul took advantage of a conflict between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Paul's trying to put in a, insert a wedge issue here to help his case out. Paul says, said, I am on trial concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And that's, of course, true because Paul uh, all along was preaching that the resurrection of Jesus was the resurrection of the first fruits, that that would be followed by the resurrection of, of all believers. Uh, but this is the, the wedge issue. You see, Paul was a Pharisee, and Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. They believed that... Um, on the last day, God would break into history, uh, banish the enemies from the land, restore the kingdom to Israel, and raise the faithful Jews to participate in this idyllic kingdom. Okay. So that's what the Pharisees believed. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's uh, why they were Sadducee. Sorry, bad joke. Um, there are other differences between Pharisees and Sadducees, but uh, this, is the, this is the wedge issue that Paul is trying to use. It worked. The Pharisees came to Paul's defense. They considered him one of them. But the enemies of Paul conspired to kill him. The, the Sanhedrin adjourned for the day Enemies of Paul were conspiring to kill him. They, they planned to assassinate Paul while he was being brought back um, to, the, to the hearing the next day. <clears throat> the son of Paul's sister heard of the plot and informed the authorities. This is the first we've heard that Paul had a sister. Very interesting. Her son caught word of this plot and informed the authorities. Now, the Jewish authorities in charge did not want the murder of a Roman citizen to happen on their watch. Again, there might be serious consequences for that. So in the middle of the night, Paul was transferred under heavy guard to the Roman authorities at Caesarea. Now he's out of Jerusalem. Now we're up to Acts 24. Now, Paul was under the authority of the Roman governor, Felix. Let me talk a little bit about the politics of that area in, at that time. Um, Felix, uh, uh, at this time, held the same position that Pontius Pilate did at the crucifixion, the uh, direct Roman governor of Judea. 
Now, how that happened was um, back at the time of the birth of Jesus, um, Herod, King Herod the Great was king over all of that area. Herod the Great died a couple of years after the birth of Jesus, and the Romans divided up his territory among three of his sons. Uh, Herod had several wives and many children. Uh, three of his sons received the kingdom. Archelaus in Judea, Antipas, Herod Antipas in Galilee, and Philip uh, for the areas uh, east of the Jordan. Now, Archelaus, oh, by the way, Herod Antipas is the Herod that we, that we read about in Luke during the crucifixion story. Okay. Two different Herods, Herod the Great at the birth of Jesus and Herod Antipas of Galilee during uh, the, uh, the crucifixion story. Now, Archelaus was such an incompetent king that even the Romans couldn't stand him. So they deposed him and installed a direct Roman governor over Judea. And that was the position held by Pontius Pilate at the time of the crucifixion and, and also the office that Felix held uh, at the time we're talking about here. So that's a little bit of the story of the politics of that region. High priest Ananias came to Caesarea with some elders and an attorney. Now, you know that once the lawyers get involved, things are going to get complicated. And this, this is no exception. <coughs> Ananias was a high priest in the temple, a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, and uh, so he came out to Caesarea. Ananias accused Paul of being an agitator. That was the charge against him. Paul denied starting in any disruption. His opponents were the agitators, according to Paul. And of course, that was true. It was the, his opponents that started the riot and cited the crowd. He declared his worship of the God of his ancestors and spoke of his hope in God and the resurrection of the dead. Now, Felix, who was already informed about this movement called the Way, postponed the case, but kept Paul in custody, hoping that Paul would pay him a bribe. That's the way things worked in those days. After two years, two years went by with Paul in prison. Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, who again left Paul in prison, wanting to grant the Jews a favor. Now we're up to Acts 25. Paul still in prison in Caesarea. Paul's enemies are still out to get him. They asked Festus, here's a new, Festus is the new leader in town, right? Maybe, maybe they can talk him into something that they, they weren't able to do with Felix. So Paul's enemies asked Festus to send Paul back to Jerusalem for trial. Their real agenda was that they were planning for an ambush on the way to kill Paul on the way back to Jerusalem. Now, Festus was not stupid. He may have been a new guy, but he wasn't stupid. Festus told Paul's accusers, well, if you want to bring charges against Paul, come to Caesarea to do it. He wasn't going to try to send Paul back to Jerusalem. Paul's enemies did come to Caesarea and, and accused Paul of violating Jewish law. <clears throat> now, this was all rather confusing to Festus. Apparently, Felix had been familiar with this movement, Christian movement called the Way. Festus, not so much. So Paul insisted on a hearing in Rome appealing to the emperor. Paul was trying to... Uh, save himself from being executed in Jerusalem. Festus agreed to this. I think probably at this time, he just wanted to get this Paul fellow out of his hair. King Agrippa II arrived in Caesarea and Festus asked for his advice on Paul's case. <clears throat> okay, who's King Agrippa II? 
Um, remember I said that uh, after the incompetent Archelaus as king, uh, a direct Roman governor was established for Judea. Uh, that went on for a few years uh, until Agrippa II's father, called Agrippa I, of course, um, was appointed uh, king of the Jews, king of Judea. How did this happen? It seems that um, Agrippa I was helpful to Claudius in becoming emperor in Rome after the assassination of Emperor Caligula that happened in, I think, 41 or the year 41 or 42, something like that. So possibly as a reward for his, Claudius appointed Agrippa to be uh, king of Judea and his son called Agrippa II um, inherited that office. Now, the, um, these Jewish kings were, uh, they had a Jewish background, although, you know, fairly, fairly slim. Herod the Great, back at the time of the birth of Jesus, was only half Jewish. His mother was Jewish. His father was Edomian. Um, Herod, Herod's household followed mostly Greek practices rather than Jewish practices. These uh, so-called Jewish kings were familiar with the Judaism, uh, but they didn't, weren't necessarily observant. Uh, so here you have a strange balance of power in this region. You have the Roman governor, you have the king of the Jews, which who was only sort of Jewish. And then there was the high priest in the temple and the Sanhedrin, which we, were the religious authorities. So the balance of power was just pretty delicate here. Uh, everybody looking out for their own interests. <clears throat> so anyway, to get back to the story, the king arrived in Caesarea. A Festus didn't know anything about Judaism, so he asked Agrippa for his advice on how to handle this case. Festus said that Paul had done nothing deserving death, at least according to Roman law, but Festus didn't want to send Paul to the emperor without some description of the charges against him, and frankly, Festus didn't really understand the charges against him. <clears throat> not being familiar with Jewish law. So the king said, well, I'd better hear from this Paul guy uh, myself. So he called for to bring Paul so that he could hear what he had to say. Now we're up to Acts 26. Paul presented his defense to Agrippa, telling his story again, this time emphasizing his Jewish roots. Because now he's talking to someone who knows about that sort of thing. <clears throat> he, Paul talks about his devout Jewish upbringing, that he lived as a Pharisee, even persecuting members of the way. He told the story of his revelation on the road to Damascus. This story is told several times in the book of Acts, and this is one of them. And he was obedient to the heavenly vision that he, that he saw. He proclaimed that the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, Jesus was, uh, was, was the, the first to be raised from the dead. Festus exclaimed upon hearing this, you are out of your mind, Paul. See, Festus didn't know anything about Messiahs or all of that stuff resurrection of the dead and you know so let me let me read what um what Festus said <clears throat> uh chapter 26 verse 24 while Paul was making this defense Festus explained you are out of your mind Paul too much learning is driving you insane maybe that's my problem too much learning but Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking the sober truth. Indeed, the king knows about these things, and to him I speak freely. 
for I am certain that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, are you so quickly persuading me to become a Christian? Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that not only you, but also all who are listening to me today might become such as I am, except for these chains. Finally, Agrippa found that Paul had done nothing to deserve death or imprisonment, even from a Jewish point of view. This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to the emperor. It is now once, uh, apparently once someone appeals to the emperor, the local authorities have nothing to do with it anymore. So now we go on to Paul's a journey to Rome, Acts 27. So the prisoners, there was more than one. Paul wasn't the only prisoner here. The prisoners and their guard, there are soldiers that went along with them. The head of the soldiers was a centurion named Julius. So they set sail for Italy. Luke, again, here uses we, implying that Paul's friends were on board as well. Luke was traveling with them. Julius was kind to Paul and allowed him to be with his friends. He could freely as associate with the non-prisoners that were on the ship. I guess Julius probably thought, well, uh, where is he going to go? He's on board a ship. But they had trouble, weather trouble. Progress was slow against an unexpected strong headwind. Uh, they were uh, trying to make progress. They went on the leeward side of Cyprus and Crete, trying to stay away from that headwind. Were not entirely successful. Their progress was much slower than expected. Paul warned against sailing past Crete because it was the stormy time of the year. They had been slowed down so much that it was getting toward fall now. Uh, when the storms are start, going to start coming over the Mediterranean, and none of the ships at that time uh, could, uh, could take those storms. Basically, shipping was shut down in the Mediterranean from uh, November through March during that time because of all of the storms. We read, the fast had already gone by. The fast is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Uh, that on our calendar happens in late September or October. So as it happens here in the Pacific Northwest, so it was over the Mediterranean, the storms are starting to roll in. Now, unfortunately, instead of listening to Paul's warnings, the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship. Now, those two guys have a vested interest in completing this journey. They don't get paid until they deliver their cargo. This is primarily a cargo ship. That's how they make their monies, hauling cargo. These passengers are just going along for the ride. So uh, the owner of the ship, of course, wanted to get to where they were supposed to go, deliver the cargo, and, and get his money. Um, and in fact, at first, it, that decision paid off. They, they had a, a, a light southerly wind for a short period of time, and then a, a violent storm came and, and overcame the ship. In a desperate attempt to stay afloat, the crew threw the cargo overboard. The sailors tried to abandon the ship, but Paul prevented them from doing so. Let me read that story. Uh, this is Acts 27, starting with verse 27. When the 14th night had come, they had 14 nights in this storm. Think about it. When the 14th night had come, 
as we were drifting across the Sea of Adria, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took soundings and found 20 fathoms. A little farther on, they took soundings again and found 15 fathoms. Fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. But when the sailors tried to escape from the ship and had lured the boat into the sea, they had a lifeboat on this ship. The sailors were going to try to escape in this lifeboat. <clears throat> but when the sailors tried to escape from the ship and had lured the boat into the sea on the pretext of putting out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the boat and set it adrift. So the sailors were stuck on the ship with the rest of them. They needed the sailors. The ship ended up beached on the island of Malta. All passengers made it to land. Those who could swim uh, swam to shore. Those who couldn't swim grabbed onto sections of the boat and paddled their way. Everybody made it to shore safely, but the ship was a total loss. Mm -hmm. Now, I have some artwork that I'd like to show. This is from Pastor Randy. He was good enough to share some artwork with me. Here's an artist's depiction of the shipwreck of St. Paul. 1794, done in 1794. This is a depiction of St. Paul at the shore at Malta, painted about 1600. But Paul's journey to Rome isn't done yet. He's stuck on Malta for a while. There's no point in trying to continue this journey until winter is over. Otherwise, there would just be another shipwreck. <coughs> so he stays in Malta for the winter. <coughs> they were building a fire on the, um, on the, uh, on the shore, on the, on the beach. Paul was haul, uh, hauling a bundle of wood and there was a, a venomous snake inside of the wood that came out and latched onto his hand. Uh, Paul shook the snake off into the fire, but the people, uh, the people from Malta that, were, that witnessed this uh, expected him to swell up and die because this, evidently this was a poisonous snake, snake. But amazingly, Paul suffered no harm. At first, <clears throat> the people of Malta, when that snake bit him, the people of Malta said, well, this guy might, must be some kind of serious, serious criminal. First, he shipwrecked, and then when he's saved from the shipwreck, a poisonous snake bites him. But when Paul survived the snake bite with no trouble at all, the people started to think, well, maybe this guy is a god. That's why he can suffer no harm. Paul healed many sick people on the island of Malta. The people brought their sick to him and, and he healed them. And uh, he became quite well known on the island for, for doing that. When it was finally time for him to leave again on a ship to Rome, the people were very happy to supply provisions for their continued journey because Paul helped them so much. There's a, there's a cave in Malta um, that um, is on a uh, like a tour route uh, uh, for tourists that is apparently where Paul stayed while he was in Malta. They're not, they don't say absolutely that's true, but um, it's considered a possibility that he stayed in that cave. And so it's part of the, it's still part of the story in Malta. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Beverly? Yeah. Now that you brought up this uh, thing about Malta, the uh, Croatians think that it actually was the island of Met in the Adriatic Sea. Oh, yeah? Malta at all. So. 
That's it, was a long, it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But good, I mean, look it up. It just says Paul on, on the net. It's spelled M-L-J-E-T. J- oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll have to I'll have to research that. I didn't There's know that. The whole story about it. But yeah. As it says, Adria in the Bible. Yes. Adriatic Sea, and they said yeah. the, the natural routes were to go north, not west. It's yes. Just stranded. That's well, interesting. And and the name of that island, Larry, it, uh, is very close to M A L T A, right? Right, Melita. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, the Maltese, the Maltese think he was there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Luke, Luke is writing this story many years after these events happened, so it's quite possible that there's some confusion in this story. Yeah. Okay, so winter's over in Malta or wherever this is. Uh, so Paul uh, got on a ship and sailed on to Rome. Uh, he was placed under house arrest there. He had his own place where he stayed with his guard. So whoever was assigned to guard him. But he was allowed to receive visitors and lived there for two years, Luke writes. Luke says, he was proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Here Luke's story ends. It ends without resolving what eventually happened to Paul. We don't know. As for whether Paul got out of Rome alive or not, the debate continues. There are various legends about Paul still doing missionary activity after he he left Rome. There's a legend about a fourth missionary journey. There's a legend about Paul getting as far as Spain. Um, Actually, I have another piece of artwork that depicts how it probably really ended for Paul. Uh, This is the martyrdom of St. Paul. Most likely he was martyred by the Romans, um, executed by the sword. Uh, The the Roman citizens, when they, uh, when the Romans needed to execute one of those, one of their own citizens, they used a sword because they thought it was much quicker and then, and therefore more humane than crucifixion, which I guess if you had to compare the two, I I would agree with, but uh, uh, the, the Romans used uh, execution by the sword for their own citizens. Ask Marie Antoinette. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm going to unshare my screen and because I'm, we're at the end of the book of Acts. I have no more material. Maybe we can talk about uh, what we've gone through today. Very interesting story about maybe it wasn't really Malta. I I wasn't aware of that. Is is there any consistency between religious traditions of what is thought to have happened to Paul? For example, I'm pretty sure that in the Roman Catholic Church, it's well accepted that Paul was martyred. Yeah. Um, Yeah. but, But do you know of any differences in the in other in the reform tradition or the you know oh yeah i don't know about the i don't know about that of course there are there are actually locations in spain that <laughs> they claim to be you know they invite tourists to come and visit the places where paul was uh so yeah. you know those people uh, think that paul made it out of rome do you know what kind of evidence that they is it all legend or are there documents or are there archaeological I, finds or i don't know of any historical evidence to support that maybe somebody else does any anybody have any idea about that or was it just a story that was told so often that it was thought to be true yeah probably probably and of course people want to make money off these tourist attractions as well 
That's what I was going to say. You know, <laughs> if you think he was there, and you can and you can get a tour bus going to the site. And uh, yeah, George Washington <laughs> slept here. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, nobody can disprove it. Right? Either that or Abraham Lincoln. You know. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Hemingway. Hemingway drank here. Isn't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't Paul supposed to be in Rome with Peter? That's a good question. They were executed in Rome at about the same time, in the early 60s. Both of them were executed in the early 60s. So it's possible that they were in Rome at I the thought, same time. I thought they were in prison together. Yeah. I do not know about that. Again, that's just tradition or whatever handed down. As Steve says, there's no documentation for that. Right. Well, now, Paul and Peter didn't get along all that well, right? Well, I mean, Paul got along with Peter better than he got along with James. Uh, well, true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but yes, well, if you read the book of Galatians, why he was he was outraged at Peter's behavior when they uh, when Peter came to to meet with Paul. Paul, of course, was eating with the Gentiles and Peter joined them as well. But then when the contingent led by James came from uh, Jerusalem, Peter separated himself from the Gentiles and only ate with the Jews. Now, uh, Paul was uh, called Peter a hypocrite to his face because of that. Um, but so, yeah, there were, they, had, they had their troubles, that's for sure. <laughs> There's a, a reference to the Catholic thing about... Um, the church wanting to identify with Peter and and Paul being there at the same time. And they made sure that Paul or, or that they they got Peter because they wanted a direct line to the Pope. I mean to to be seen as um, the head of the church. And so they moved Paul's bones to a a uh, crypt outside of the church so you have you have the church of St. Paul's outside the walls and, the, and then the Peter is in Rome or in the Vatican um, well in Rome yeah okay so, yeah. But that was a that was a um, church politic thing but that that makes me think that Peter there that Paul died along the same time. Uh, well, the, the closest estimates is for both of them between, between, the, between the years 62 and 64 for, for, yeah, for, for both of them, yeah. Mm, but that would, that would uh, lend itself to the idea that Paul was executed in Rome at about the same time that Peter was rather than right. him escaping yeah. to Spain, for example. Right, right. right. They, I mean, the years they they think it was under the Emperor Nero, so right. So yeah, put that time frame there, whatever. Yeah. Now, did Paul write letters from Rome in those last two years? If he did, million dollar question, Larry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 don't have any of those letters. If he did, but it would be unusual if he didn't. You would, right. you would think, yes. Yeah. He was such a prolific writer. Yeah, several of his letters were written from prison, prisons and places, yes. There's a, there's a current, I don't know if you call it religion or spiritual practice or something that I don't know much about, but our neighbors used to practice it. And apparently they were following Paul's early practices of home churches or something and so their home was the gathering place on sunday morning for um people who shared that belief um and 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 so they they didn't call themselves christians they didn't call themselves christians was that the way is that is that the way i mean they they didn't so they had no um, Christian holidays. They didn't celebrate Christmas and Easter. And um, women, 
always wore dresses. They never cut their hair. <clears throat> um, I mean, they were good neighbors and they were really fun to be with, but it was just, it was such an interesting difference and I never really found out very much about it. So is that a common, I, I don't think they would have called themselves a religion even, but you know, what do you, how, how do you talk about that? And is, is that the same as the current, the way? Does anybody know? I, I, I have heard of the way in current times yeah. as sort of code mm -hmm. for there is a <clears throat> group of uh, there's sort of a movement to get back to early Christian church policies and be the, like the early church. Yeah. But I hadn't heard it in terms of that they weren't Christian. No, That's they it. and the conversations that we had was very clear about that. They did not call themselves Christian. But they were following Paul's early practices. And I mean, they would like our, our street would be um, lined with cars that would come to their house every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And they didn't have a pastor. That was not part of it either. Or if they did, the pastor, I don't know all that, but the pastor didn't have a church or a parsonage and i don't know if if the pastor lived with various people i mean it was just such an interesting thing and i didn't learn enough about it when they were here and they just moved away but it, i mean there were a lot of people right here that belonged to that group so it makes me think that it might be something that is around in other you know around here well i i think that there are a lot of people who yearn for a more authentic church experience. They see organized religion as too uh, business-like or too corrupt or whatever. And so they're, they're trying to get back to basics, sort of like the, the folks who want to live off the land. You know, it's that kind of yearning for a really authentic experience. Um, but I'd never thought that they, I mean, if you're going to follow early Paul, wouldn't you call yourself Christian? I mean, that's sort of, that was his brand, right? Although, when did the term Christianity come into I was going to say, that didn't, that didn't happen right away, did it? Yeah, no, I don't think so. It, it didn't happen right away. The, uh, the, the members of the way became known as, uh, people started calling them Christians in Antioch. Okay. Yeah. In, what, in what? In, in Antioch, Syrian mm -hmm. Antioch, the church in Antioch. Um, that was, um, uh, I, that, that appears earlier in Acts where, where it says that, 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 that was the place that, uh, the members of the way were first uh, called Christians. Well, I hesitate to speak for Jesus, but is it possible that like Martin Luther didn't want to start a new church? Jesus didn't want to start a new church. You know, was Jesus just trying to be a really good Jew to, who fulfilled prophecy? rather than starting a new religion? No, I think he was a reformer. I don't think he intended to start a new religion. Yeah, I agree. <coughs> I'm not sure he even was focused on the Gentiles. He was and a reformer of Jews. So we've often heard that Martin Luther was adamantly opposed to his followers being called Lutherans. I wonder what Jesus thinks about all of us being called Christians. I wondered, I've wondered that too. Yeah. Well, and especially because Christ is a title, not a name. So shouldn't we be Jesus's? Jesuits. <laughs> we should be, we should be Jesuits. Jesuits. Yeah, we should. <laughs> yeah. I guess, I guess Christians are believers in the Messiah because, you know, Christ means anointed, yeah. the anointed one or the Messiah. So Christians would be believers in the Messiah. Okay, that's better. <laughs> well, we're reaching the end of our time here, so uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, please join me next week for my book report class on uh, <laughs> Paul for a New Day. We'll be grading you. <laughs> this, this, is, this is great because Paul is so important. Yes. It's yes. been fascinating to me. I love the, the history and the travel log stuff. I love that part. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. 
Very good. Very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you there.